Hello guys! It's everything done lightly. A lot happening. Hope you go over to the Substack, check us out. I hope you go and look at our podcasts here. Go look at our www.first-things.org. I am thankful to bring you Andrew Kern today. Founder and, uh, well, all around sort of the, the mind and soul behind Circe Institute, the center for independent research on classical education. If you are a parent or a human, you should listen to this talk. Education is the conversation. And wow, it's good stuff. When we sign off, I got some information for you. I'd love for you to hear. But right now, Andrew Kern and this is my boy, Greg Gilbertson, bringing us a little bit of the Wattar song, a little bit of the heavy things done lightly. Andrew Kern is with us from Circe Institute. Did I say Circe right? I never, is it Circe? Like, did I say it right? Depends what, what region you're from. If you're Greek, you got to say Kirke. Kirke, yeah, you're right. If you're from Wisconsin, you'll probably say Circe. If you're from Kentucky, you might say Circe. We don't worry about it. Just how don't do, say circle. Yeah, no, circle's no good. How do you hear it in your <laughs> head when you're when you're dreaming of all oh. the things that you're accomplishing in the world? Circe? I think Circe. Circe? All right, here's yeah. a toast. I want to toast... Ah. Because we shared Art of Tamada together. Guys, this is Andrew Kern, uh, founder. He's just the guy behind Circe Institute, which we're going to talk about yeah. today. But, just uh, a guy. Just a guy. But they showed up out of the blue to Art of Tamada. Not out of the blue. I mean, we knew you were coming. <laughs> but I kind of like if you just crashed it. That would have been better. But, <laughs> but uh, he and his son and um, just some good people. Well, actually, Matthew didn't come, but... Uh, Man. Anyway, we had this crew, and now we're besties, and I want to give a toast to serendipity and to gratitude uh, for paying attention to things and then making them happen in a way where uh, we all benefit from them. You helped us by showing up. So to, to you guys yeah. and to that moment of serendipity, Gagi Marjos. Marjos. So this is uh, Heavy Things Lightly. We're trying to figure out old and new world, and then here come... Circe Institute people, you in particular, an author and a human being trying to offer classical education resources and, and really just the essence of it to the world. And does anybody care? That's my first question. <laughs> does anybody care? Let me make a distinction between names and things then if you ask that question, because that's a good question. If you say the word classical, edu the words classical education, some people get excited and some people get turned off. My contention, however, is that if you're dealing with the thing, classical education, it's what everybody wants when it comes mm -hmm. to education. And you Until can they see grow it. up and, and need, need, you know, get scared. But free people want classical education. And you see it in the way they, they clamor and kind of consume what you guys are doing, because you're still, you're here and doing amazing things. So it must be that there's proof in the concept, yeah? Well, that's nice of you to say it that way, um, that they're clamoring. <laughs> um, but we do find that when, well, there's a price to it, okay? So, so there's, the modern mind is very driven by methods and mechanisms and formulas and the quick buck. Classical education isn't going to give you methods, mechanisms, and formulas in the quick buck. Mm. So there is a, there's a price that people have to pay. And for some people, it's not worth the price, I would say. But in general, the people that we've been able to work with and that have, let's say, engaged it, embraced it, they are they're just like I have been transformed by it. Yeah. Yeah. What's transforming about it in your own huh. in your own experience? Well, wow, you ask good questions. Um, the way we define classical education here at Circe is that it's the cultivation of wisdom and virtue by nourishing the soul on the true, the good, and the beautiful. Hmm. And there's more to it, of course, but but that simple framework, if you just think of it that way, it's almost like the sufficient answer to your question. But what's transforming about it? When you really read a book, let's say 
uh, Chronicles of Narnia or uh, Tolkien um, or Homer, you just aren't the same person when you're done reading it. Mm. And it's not that you've been persuaded to believe something. It's that you see the world differently. And it's that you've been fed. It's that it's that you're healthier. Um, it's that you have you become something like what you've read wow. as odd as that might sound. And that all of that leads to a transformation. And so if you keep doing that and then you discuss it with people like you and I are doing right now, this is a huge part of the whole experience. Like right now you and I are encountering classical education because you said, what do you mean by that? And then you asked, then you, then you asked me to explain myself, right? That's a classical thing to do. So good. Right? And so, so, Right now, we are we are classically educating each other through friendship and through discussion. And that's the essence of classical education. And so so what's transformative about it is that it it deepens your your soul and enriches it. It it makes you I, I have often said that the goal of education is to be a good friend. And people then they 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 listen to that and say, Oh, that's you know funny, ha ha. <laughs> but that's what Aristotle says. And yeah. that's what Cicero says. You know, the, the 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 one of my one of the best books in the whole classical tradition is by Cicero, and it's called De Amicitia, which is Latin for on friendship. And at the very last paragraph of his, his it's a dialogue actually, a bunch of friends talking. And at the very last paragraph of the text goes like this. Finally, one piece of advice on parting. Virtue, without which friendship is impossible is the greatest of all things. But next to virtue, and to virtue alone, the greatest of all things is friendship. Now, think about that. For 25, for 2,000 years, anybody in the Western world who went to school and got educated probably had to learn that in Latin. Well, it would have been, you know, it wouldn't have been first year. They probably had to learn that in Latin. And then they had to translate it into their language, mm -hmm. which means they had to think about it. Yeah. And what they were thinking about is one of the richest thoughts any human being has ever expressed. I mean, think about it. Virtue, without which friendship is impossible, is the greatest of all things. Okay, as soon as you hear that phrase, you're in, right? You want, you want what he's talking about. And I know that because I've taught high school. And well, the very first year I started teaching, which was 1993 in a school setting, I had my class read that. And I taught them a highlighting system for what it's worth, where blue would be something they really liked. And one of the girls in the class, she wanted to highlight the whole thing in blue and put it in frames and put it on her wall. Like she wanted to just think about that book for the rest of her life. That didn't happen to me in school when I read textbooks. That's but right. in a classical school, in the classical tradition, you don't read textbooks. You read the great books. And they're great books because they say great things and they say them really well. Right. And that's another element of how, why is it transformative? Because I'm, I didn't read that as a child, right? I didn't read those lines as a child. I wish I had, hmm. I believed it. I knew it as a child. I knew that virtue is what makes friendship possible, but I never thought the thought, right? My soul knew it, but I never thought it. And man, if I could have thought that, how much better could my life have been if I could have actually thought that thought that virtue without which friendship is impossible is the greatest of all things. What kid doesn't value friendship? Some might argue that's you're describing something not necessarily meant for a system, for a school. You might, I might not argue meant for that a system. Yeah. Here's what I mean. Like my friends in Mali, West Africa, I think they mm -hmm. intuit that. Now mm -hmm. they haven't read Aristotle, but I think they intuit that I need to slow down, not even need to slow down because that would imply they were already speeded up. But it's like mm -hmm. the life is is like I'm going to do this because I I need this for my life, which is to bear your burden, and so I'm just going to do it. It's it's all unspoken, mm -hmm. but now you're talking about classical education, and everybody in this podcast is going to hear education as system, um, as something that huh. I'm, I'm put into in order to do that. So why would I even go to school for that? One, what, what, I don't get that. Wow. That's, I mean, that, okay. This is, this is, 
All right. I told you, I told you beforehand that I'm, I'm trying to, I'm working on like a treatise. I'm trying to, I'm trying to summarize my thoughts from the last 30 years. You're right. And in that treatise, I am. Yeah. You, and you, it'll be done in this summer, the end of May. Guys, we want Andrew to write this book and we can't wait to read it. This guy's filled with, we Thank met you. each other. We know each other, but go ahead. I can't wait to hear this, this answer. I want to hear this. Well, in the middle of it or somewhere in it, it's going to make a case that there was this terrible, well, there was a great transition that took place, right? And, and it happened. Education didn't fall apart in the 60s, right? It didn't fall apart in the 90s. I love reading like on Facebook or, 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 or um, X or whatever. And people will talk about the education that they got as a child as though that was a golden age or else it'll be <laughs> the generation right before them. Like that the was 90s. the golden age. Right. Yeah. Well, the 70s. Yeah, and, so and, good. And, yeah. Yeah. Right. So I grew up in the 70s and I will say this. I had some really good teachers, mm -hmm. some wonderful teachers, and we read some really good books. Um, I even listened to some good music, but I didn't get a good education. And the people that that wanted to go back to the fifties would not did not get a good education. Education didn't fall apart in the fifties or sixties or seventies or because of World War II or whatever. Education in America has never been very good, hmm. but it especially fell apart. There was there was a big battle in eighteen eighty to nineteen twenty. There was a culture wide battle going on about education, and you could say it was between the classical educators. And the progressives. I think a more accurate way to put it would be is between traditionalists and, and, and progressives. Mm. And, and the progressives won that battle so totally, so completely, that from 1920 to the present day, classical education has tried desperately to find corners in a college every now and again. It's just a, it tries to dig, it tries to dig a, a foxhole and survive. Education in America I say has never been really good, although up until the rebel, up until about 1800, it was pretty good, right? Hmm. And, and in fact, compared to nowadays, it was phenomenally good. You could do, in fact, forgive me for this, because I don't want to lose sight of the question. But I like this, quickly, I like this rabbit hole. You can divide American history into three periods, both culturally and pedagogically, okay? There's the, there's the period up to, let's say 1800. In a way you could say up to the revolution, but let's say 1800. And that's the period that we could we could call, Paige Smith does in fact call it, the classical and Christian period. The greatest achievement of the classical and Christian period was the U.S. Constitution. Okay, and, and during that period, not very many people went to school. Well, I take that back. In Massachusetts, almost everybody did. L literacy in Massachusetts was like 98%. Um, wow, in the 18th century even. Yeah, colossally better than today. And then, but in the South, it wasn't by any means. Mm -hmm. But during that time period, education was very local and it was very classical. But what you got educated for at that time was to become a leader in society. That meant a minister. It meant um, a, a local, polit not politician so much, but a statesman, because they didn't really do politics like we do. Um, it, it, it meant taking leadership in society. That's what you got educated for. That's why you went to school. Then what happens is in the 19th century, America becomes extremely conscious of itself as a country. And so a, a education shifts from being a classical and Christian form of education to being, I'm gonna call it a traditional in a limited sense. I don't mean in a, you know, the capital T mm -hmm. sense, but in the sense that we now are a community and education is education is for the sake of the community. Yeah, that's right. That's the German model, right? On some level, coming in. Um, or is that going to come a little? That's later? an extreme version of it. Because yeah. what I'm what I'm suggesting here is that in the in the 18th century, if you went to school, it was for the community. But the way you were going to serve your community was by becoming virtuous. Okay, the goal was wisdom and virtue. In the 19th century, it's for the community, and the way you're going to serve your community is by knowing its story. All right. So, so now the tradition kind of becomes an end in itself. Now that's a hyper oversimplified way of putting it, but, but the shift is taking place. It's so that you can say, I am an American. Yeah, that's and, right. And I can see that's why, right. because in the 19th century, the America was very proud to be American, that's right. right? Country songs were coming out. I'm proud to be an American. Yeah. 
And then, and nobody had yet sung Born in the USA. And then on the 4th of July, they play it not knowing that it's an anti-American song. It's so funny. But anyway, so, so in the 19th century, it's very patriotic, very traditional, but the orientation is now not toward, let's say, internal wisdom for the sake of the community, but now it's toward the community as a, as a goal. Now, eventually what that leads to is, well, it takes place within the Industrial Revolution, and that's when the notorious John Dewey comes along and brings in a whole new philosophy of existence and a whole new approach to education. And you said earlier on, everybody who's listening to your podcast, when they hear the word education, are going to think about a system. That's because they've all been educated under John Dewey. Yeah. Okay. It was John Dewey who started the National Education Association, which is the teachers union. It was John Dewey who started the, the systems of, of, of public schooling. And by the time you got to the 50s, which was Dewey died, I think it was 1948. But the, when you get to the 50s, then after World War II, the American mindset is, hey, look what we were able to do. We were able to conquer the world and defeat the Japanese and defeat the Nazis by being so superior in our industry and by being so well managed. So what happens is all these soldiers come home. They get the GI Bill, of course, which destroys college education. It's good for the students, some of them who should have been there, but it destroys the system. And then secondly, they take all these local schools and they consolidate them, right? And now the, now the administration of the school becomes more important than the education of the children. And the other thing that's crucial is in 1946, in, in, the, in the nine months between September of 1945 and, well, let's just say to the middle of 1946, Every woman in America had a baby, maybe two or three even. <laughs> there was a boom. <laughs> but for some reason, that system that they put in place for education didn't even notice that all these babies were born. And five years later, trillions of babies grabbed the lunchbox, paper bag, and walked down to their local kindergarten. And the teachers walked to the door and screamed at the number of children who yeah, arrived. It blew it out. They had had five years to prepare and they didn't bother. And that led to the rise of the textbook. Okay. And the textbook is one of the most destructive forces in America in, in education. Uh, um, now, instead of reading a great book like Cicero, you, you can't. You, you have to teach or proof the classroom now. Right. If you've got all these children, you have to administer all those children and you have to make the teacher not harm them. And so you have to replace the teacher. Well, what you have to do is convert the teacher into an administrator of information on behalf yeah, of data a manager. Yeah, company. data manager. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And then information into the data point, right? And so that so that leads to the explosion. And then, of course, it leads to the explosion of administration. And then it leads to the textbook publishing companies. I mean, there were textbooks in the 30s and 40s, but go get some. I've read them. They're pretty good, mm. right? Because because they're they're innocent still. But in the 50s, they've discovered, hey, you know what? If we can replace the teachers, we can make a fortune off these books. That's right. And so what they do is they replace them every five years. So the whole every school in the country has to buy the new textbooks because they added four paragraphs. You know, and, and, and nobody nobody ever looks at. I mean, I remember my history textbook. My brother had one and then I had another because they changed between my he was two years older than me. And they changed the history textbook. And what was the change? I, it was a, in those days, 35, 40 bucks, you know, to, for each book. They added a paragraph at the end that we never got yep. to. I, I, I taught history for 15 years. In okay, so you know what I'm talking about. And I'd be like, something's not right here because this is the same book. And why is it also $78? Yeah. What's happening right It's now? because you have a monopoly. That's why. Yeah. Because you have a government-mandated monopoly on education. And, and, and Pearson... And I, I mean, I discovered about 10 or 15 years, 20 years ago now, it, it was it, it happened that two German publishing companies bought all the American text, major American textbook publishing companies. I think one was called Bertelsmann, and I can't remember for sure. It's 20 years ago now. But all of a sudden, American textbooks were outsourced to a country that didn't even know it. And 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 get this now, Pearson is crazy. the number one publishing company, right? They're also the college owners of the college board. So now you have assessment that this is, is administratively driven for the sake of the publisher of the textbooks. Now, again, 
I'm oversimplifying, but not by as much not as really. I wish I was. Not really. Well, you're right. I'm not very much. You're but not I really. want to be polite. This is the experience. We started a school down in Florida and we tried to embrace classical education. That's one of my questions for you is yeah. this community. So I got about four questions. Let, let's go this road and then I'll come back to the elitism question because. Well, I'm still in the middle of the, this, this other question. Keep going. All right. Finish it up. I love it. I love it. Go Because I'm talking about this great transition, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Come come back so, to this. So people inversion. might be hearing me saying, sorry, people might be hearing me saying classical education is the 50s. I'm not. They might be hearing me saying it's the 1890s. That would be better, but that's not it. They might be hearing me saying it's the 18th century. I'm not. What I'm saying is cla classical education was metaphysically and philosophically undercut and badly damaged in the 16th century. Okay, And what happened was the world went through a massive inversion. And I would go so far as to say, now I'm a Christian, I'm an Orthodox Christian, and I would go so far as to say that what happened, I could almost blame the fall of Constantinople. I, I think that is accurate. This but anyway, in that era, what happens is the Western mind begins to, uh, it begins to look for a method. Okay, it, 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 up until this time, the easiest way to put it is this, up until this time, People believed we lived in a cosmos, and they believed that we were the image of God. As images, we were a, a analogical beings, right? An image is an analogy, okay? And the world itself was an analogical cosmos. That is to say, it was an image, and it was meaningful. But by the time you get to 1600, or certainly 1700, now you don't live in a cosmos anymore. At best, you live in a universe. Mm. You no longer believe in nature, you now believe in something like chaos or maybe nothing. You no longer believe in the logos, right? You've now converted logos, nice Greek word, to nomen, a nice Latin word. In other words, you shifted from logos to nominalism, right? From, from a real world that's knowable to an unreal world that's just a, a, a creation of our own minds. Yeah, and gnosis. people don't realize the extent mm -hmm. to which what, what, what we're teaching, what we have been teaching children in schools for centuries is that the world they live in isn't knowable and that and that they can't know it so therefore they have to generate their own truth okay and that they now have a will and an identity that they are responsible to establish themselves this did not happen with transgenderism it took 400 years Beautiful. for that kind of catastrophe to happen now i got to just say this I believe in something absolutely positive. I believe we're going through a major transition. Uh, I mean, a, a, a half millennial, maybe a two millennial transition. The, the enlightenment um, breakdown, the fragmentation of the European mind from the 16th and 17th century, I believe is coming to an end. It's, it's reached its, its, um, its fullness in chaos, right? So, so, Artificial intelligence, one of the most ridiculously named things in the history of the world, as though there could be artificial intelligence. Right? That sort of thing is the is the end game hmm. of the the mistakes from the 1600s. And so I believe that we're now we're going through a transition. The trouble, of course, is transitions are always really hard. But we're going through a transition into a world that if we pray well... And if we get back to Christ the Logos as the foundation of thought, and if we are humble, I believe we could be ushering in a, a new 500-year age of, of new insight and a more mature insight than, than we've had for the last and maybe, maybe 1,500 years. So the inversion... I Andrew, this is so fast, fascinating. The inversion in some ways, the destruction of what have has happened is now leading to a, an invitation to something like, oh, that's good. like fixing it, something like um, classical education. It's, it's the time yes. for that. Yes, it's time. Yes. In fact, I, I'm, I'll be starting a podcast on which I'll inter, in, invite you to for an interview. I would love it. And, Eventually, I don't know when I'm starting it yet, but just everybody be warned. <laughs> Run. I'm going to call it Minerva's Owl. And the Which reason is, I'm calling it Minerva's all, yeah, Owl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I want to hear this. Did I tell you about this? No, but I, I looked in. I, I saw some of your blogs there in Minerva Zal, but I, oh, didn't, okay. I don't know the reason for it. I want to hear this. Okay, so the reason for that is this. Georg Hegel, the German philosopher, famously said, the owl of Minerva only flies at dusk. And what he was saying is, if you, if you know who Minerva is, she's a goddess of wisdom. She's Athena, right? The Roman name for Athena. Mm -hmm. And the owl is a symbol of wisdom. Right. Well, what what Hegel is saying is wisdom only makes it. Well, basically what he's saying is wisdom only makes itself available when it's too late. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I don't know exactly what he means, but the way I take it is this. We are living at the end of an age. At the end of the day, you know, things that you didn't know at the beginning that you couldn't have known at the beginning in a similar way at the end of an age. You have no choice but to know things that you didn't need to know even 50 years ago. For example, nobody seems to know what a man or a woman is anymore, hmm. right? Nobody wondered 50 years ago. And the reason we now have to know something so basic is because the age is coming to an end. Hmm. And so there are things that are becoming very vivid and very clear to us that in the past, nobody needed to know. They just lived day to day. And that, of course, extends over a period of time. But... The practical application to me is this, after dusk comes nightfall, and that's the dark, that's the transition. But after nightfall comes dawn. That's right. And if those folks who wake up in the morning have to start from scratch, God have mercy. What we have to do now, John, is we have to, all those things that are becoming very vivid and clear to us now because they have to, it's not smartness, it's necessity, right? Right, right. Things that we are forced to know philosophically, theologically, metaphysically, we got to note it, right? We got to preserve it. And we have to do so in a way that we can hand it off to the people who are going to wake up in the morning. And that's the function of education today, is we have to preserve the wisdom that has been that has been there the whole time, but now is flying crazily all over the place. We got to capture it. And my goal is to catch the owl of Minerva and put it in a cage so that all night long she sings to my children and grandchildren so that when they wake up in the morning, all they have to do is walk over to the cage and say, what's that mean again? And they'll, they'll have that running start for a new age. Now, it's not going to be utopia, right? Because one of the things that we're having to acknowledge that, that, that is so painful is that while Augustine was a bit extreme, he wasn't wrong. Mm. <laughs> His dark view of the human soul, we're seeing that all over Twitter, right? Yeah. They, put that, they put that idiotic program together thinking that it would be good for mankind to be able to just share information anonymously with each other, right? I mean, what kind of child would think that thought, right? The, the infantile minds behind the technologies that we're forced to use nowadays. Well, we're not forced to so much, but that, that the, infant, the infantilism that, that drives the technologies is unfathomable. But what it's revealing to us is mankind can't be trusted. Mankind has to be held accountable. Hmm. Mankind can be trusted if he's responsible for what he says and does. But if he's not, then you can't be trusted. You can't put on the ring of Gyges. You know, you can't put on, if you put on the ring, you become Gollum. Right. If you if you hide behind an anonymity, you destroy things. And that's one of the things we're learning is that you you have to you have to localize yourself. You have to be in your place. You have to be responsible for the person next to you and for yourself and for the ground under you, for the room you live in, for the books that you're reading. Hmm. And you you got to break out of this fantasy of this digital realm that's utopian and that that says, hey, we can make everything good by removing friction. No, God was smart when he made the world. He made it frictionful <laughs> yeah. so that we can yeah. stay, so that we can stop and think, right? So that we can slow down and think and talk to each other. Well, um, you made me think that the apostles who didn't even know themselves as that on that first night near the tomb, oh, they yeah. had to stand there and stay just close enough that the night, the three night, the two nights could pass. The, in other words, yeah. the diavolos, the disintegration had to happen, but there had to be watchers. There had to be someone who would withstand the night. Um, so in, in oh, the resurrection, great. there was someone John, to speak to. There was someone 
because Christ could then go and meet. Who is he going to meet if everyone ran? <laughs> and so we, you're saying we have to withstand the night. We have to wait for the resurrection. We have to wait for the resurrection. And either that's going to be the end of the creed, the, the, you know, the last line in the creed, not the end, but the, the last line in the creed. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Maybe that's what we're going to experience. Maybe this is the world coming to a new world. But if it's not, God is not sleeping. Right. If the Lord dies, and he only did once and never will again, but when he died, he conquered his enemies. Right. And what, what, what I believe is necessary now is that a, a new age of dying with Christ. That's right. Is what, what which we is, have to Which do. is really just, it's just the mechanics of reality. It's, Peugeot's often talking about this. It's just the mechanics of how reality works is we, we have to have the diabolos in order to have the symbolos. We have to have the disintegration uh, in order to have the, 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 the remembering. And so, and so what you're describing is I think a type of wisdom that was more obvious to the people from the old world pre enlightenment. And that well, I, don't I think it's more obvious, like you said before, to people in Mali. Right, we're so arrogant in America. We we destroy our own families for a piece of for a chocolate cake, right? And then we look and we feel superior because we can put on a better football game than the people in Mali. Yeah, right. Although their soccer teams could probably beat ours. Well, they're getting but, better. You know what? What is, they have? They have community, right? They meet at the table. We don't even meet at the table as a culture. Yeah, we don't. We get mad if we have to sit still at a table, and then we go, oh, we're. I'm so sad. I'm so depressed. Look, if you're sad and depressed, there could be many reasons for it. But this is my advice to a person who's sad. Find a table mm -hmm. and sit down at it. And then whether you put a coffee in front of you or a cinnamon bun or something, put something in front of you and then invite somebody to join you. Maybe maybe even get maybe go to Panera and, and buy a cup of coffee and two cinnamon buns, two cups of coffee and two cinnamon buns, oh, and put one that. cinnamon bun on the opposite side and just wait to see if somebody joins. I, I don't that. know. I Do it five that. times and see what. Right? In other words, if you're sad, there's a reason the word sad so often goes with the word lonely, right? Sad and mm -hmm. lonely. There is, I believe in all sadness, there's some degree of loneliness and disconnectedness. And we have, we are at the tail end of an age of massive fragmentation. Mm. The cosmos has broken up, the mind has broken up, community has broken up, and the goal of the, at the Circe Institute, our entire goal is to restore the unity that's been broken, to, to, to try to restore the harmony. I don't mean the harmony like utopian in that sense, but to restore the, to restore the habits mm. of harmony well, that used to be the goal of education. Well, just your description of education is acquiring virtue in order to have a friendship. I mean, like, by the way, very few people, very few people have ever identified, I'm talking about in, you know, in our America today, 2020s. Right. To get a job. They can't, exactly. They can't even wrap their head around what you just said. I saw a real shift with the cell phones, a real shift. I used to teach a course called The History of Love to high schoolers um, starting in 2004. And then... By 2013, for 10 years or eight years, no one asked why we're doing this class. At first, they may say, I don't really get this class. But they meant, I don't get the class for the sake of the class. By 2014, mm -hmm. 15, 16, 18 year olds, by the way, studying the history of love. Okay, very, just on its face, like, what, what's the problem? That's kind of weird and interesting. But I'm telling you, 2013, 14, 15, 16, the question was, is this is not relevant to my college application? Right. And they were serious I'm about that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised that it took that long. By the way, one of my favorite college classes I ever took was called The Myths of Love. Oh, and it, it was like that. It went back to the to the you know the ancient well, it started with the Bible and worked its way all the way up to Evita. And really? it and it we looked at medieval mythologies of love and Cupid and Psyche, and it was awesome. So a history of love is what a great thing to think about. But you're right. The, the kids have been conditioned by their hovering parents to, from the, their, their terrified parents from the time they were four to think that the reason you go, the reason you do this useless, 
mindless, mind numbing, butt killing activity for seven, eight hours a day and feel your dignity seep out of your soul all day long so that you can do something in the evening to restore your humanity, which usually means, you know, rebelling against something. The reason you are doing this is so that when you are done, you can do it for a few more years and get a job. Right. And, and the, 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 re the drive behind that, okay, it's a self-fulfilling fear, okay? And what I mean by that is, is, is at multiple levels, right? It, you can scale it like what something Jonathan Pajot would easily mm -hmm. see. You can scale this where there's the individual is scared. And so he goes to school for no other reason than he thinks if he doesn't, his life's going to be ruined. I want to just interrupt myself for a moment here and say that if my mom, when I was a kid, had got up in the morning and said, today you have to read these books and then gone to work and then left me alone, I would have got a better education and in less trouble than happened to me at school. Now, I will say, I say that because my mom would have made me, like she would have checked to see what I did, Yeah. but also because I was a catastrophe in school. But I, I think... I flunked four classes in ninth grade, and they what still was going moved me on? up to tenth you're not grade. You're not a dummy. What was going on? What was the actual spiritual rebellion? What was it? Can you oh, identify it then? Good. Could you that's identify so it? So, so what I can tell you that I'm glad you said spiritual rebellion because between my sophomore and junior year, I did have one of those after that summer camp experiences, where you know the spirit of God just convicted me of my sin, and so I had a I had a I want to follow Jesus moment. And so then I go back to school that fall and I got almost straight A's well, for one report card. But another thing that happened that, that quarter when I got all A's but one B was I had a job that I had to work 35 hours a week, right? Whereas, whereas most of the time I'm going, I'm going to school wasting unbelievable amounts of time, right? Doing as little homework as I possibly could, then coming home and not having a job, uh, I was on swim team, so that you know kept me somewhat busy. But I mean, what what was I had to f I had to fill the time, right? And yeah. so, so I was I was living. Um, now I had a I had a great church, and I had great friends from church, and I was really into sports. Who knows what I would have done if it weren't for that? But but the the meaningless of the system that I was in. Right. I felt it in my spirit and I rebelled against that. Right. Now, I studied hard for like youth group Bible studies because we had we, again, we had great youth group. We would we would we would sit and argue about the book of Daniel or you know, the book of Romans for, for a couple hours on a Saturday night. It was it was fabulous. So what, um, what a picture you're painting of this crazy nerd who was failing classes. Nerd, interesting. <laughs> well, I say I was that- cool, man. I was a I, class clown. I say that with love, I, though. I say that with love because you're really describing a bit of what my, 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 my crazy brother, Father Peter, he, he would fail classes randomly. He would like fail Spanish and then he would fail history. And then you would look and it was just because he had a beef with that teacher. It wasn't- Oh, about, interesting. Yeah, it was all about Could the I personal relationship. Yeah. Well, that's a really interesting point too, because what did happen when my when I was this is see my my biggest concern is the system, right? The fact that there is a system and that that's what people think of when they think of education. Yeah. That's a catastrophe. That is. A catastrophe. You have to ask yourself what is happening to my poor child when they're in that system. It's it's like putting a kid on an assembly uh, line and letting the machines mold them. I don't want my yeah. kids molded. Yeah. So so anyway, so when I was in school. Twice, my teachers went on strike for a long time. Like, I, I, I mean, as a kid, a long time as a day. But I think it was like six weeks when I was in wow, wow. eighth or ninth grade. And, and they had like voluntary classes. You, you could go to school because they knew we didn't have anything to do. So, so some of the teachers were strike breakers. And they would come in and they'd supervise us while we danced and stuff, it was, which I can't even do. <laughs> so it, it was ridiculous. But what I remember is... I remember at that I remember getting into high school and I would hear people say your schooling your education is the most important thing about your childhood. And I would think to my or feel if I didn't think because it's hard to know I'm 60 now it's hard to know what I actually right. thought then but but what I carried with me is 
okay, so what you're telling me is the most important thing in my life, the thing that's going to determine my future was not important enough for you to come to work and do, <laughs> right? So, so, so what am I going to take? Now I'm thinking like a child. I get that. I get that. You know, there's much more comp, but, but the system, whether it's people, whether the system failed me. Yeah, it did. You, and you can't, you, you know, that's, that's what, um, Hannah Arendt says about the, the, the Nazis, right? Is the banality of evil. Mm -hmm. If you can't fight against a system that's destroying children, then what on earth can you fight against? And if you don't think education is destroying children in America, what world are you looking at? Yeah. Right. They're, they are literally, literally going to doctors and getting their bodies torn apart. Literally. The suicide rate is now something like one in 12 kids tries to kill himself. And, and they're getting better at it, right? Schools, you can't What's just say, happen? oh, well, we only have them. You, look, you've got the majority of the time and the curriculum and the system and the way you teach is sucking the souls out of those children. No and if you would say to those kids at the beginning of the school year, listen, I'm going to teach you this year because the most important thing about you is your friendships and your friendships need you to become virtuous. Let's go from there. Everything would change instantaneously. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, in fact, we tried to do that in these little experiments of education that I got involved yeah. with. And we yeah. tried. So that's a question that goes back. How do you know when a community's ready to adopt mm. classical education? Because our school wasn't. We tried on some levels to make that personal thing happen. I'd have to have, I'd have to be able to ask you questions that you don't want asked on the air about that particular community because it's going to be different everywhere. I see. But, but I would say this, that, that there are many, many, many reasons why American parents are afraid. Okay. And if I've come across like I'm attacking parents, please forgive me because, because I understand the fears that American parents have. The economy is getting so tightened and if you don't get in, supposedly, if you don't get into college, you know, your life is going to be ruined. And, you know, obviously the fact that plumbers make as much as lawyers in America challenges that. But if, if we, we believe that we have to be in the system, right? And once, once you believe that you have to be in the system, then it's terrifying to not be in the system. That's right. There's That's no right. promises. There's no guarantees. But the trouble is what you're counting on is the system. Well, the system changes constantly and the and the the economy for which the job the school system is capable of preparing children isn't the economy they're going to grow up into right okay. that's what technology has done and so so i think there's a there's a i'm going to oversimplify and put it this way a community is ready for a classical education when enough parents which is probably four or five couples have faith that guides them instead of fear now that that can sound really caustic that can sound like really nasty and I, I don't actually think there's a group over here that has faith and a group over here that's fearful all of us are filled with fear and all of us have some degree of faith and so what it is is it's a question of is there enough faith in us struggling broken people is there enough to give it a shot and then and then is there enough faith to to genuinely believe that Christ the logos is our teacher and he illumines every man who comes into the world. Is there enough faith to believe that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added to us. We will not be ashamed. We will not go naked. We will not go hungry. We might be martyred though. Is there enough faith? It's not, it's not a matter of either or, right? I just, I, I really want to emphasize this so much that it's just not, a, in fact, that's what, pause, huh. bracket this. But one of the most crucial things in my view about classical education is it teaches the art of deliberation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And deliberation breaks down the notion of the either or it acknowledges that some things are binary because some things are binary, male and female, for example. But, mm -hmm. but when we're making decisions, it's almost never binary. It's almost always, is there enough of this? It's a matter of proportion. Yeah. And it's a so, hierarchy of so meaning, when we yeah. deliberate, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Right. And that means, that means proportion and it means, it means compromise. It doesn't necessarily mean compromise of principle. 
It might mean compromise of how a principle applies in this That's circumstance. Right. That's right. And it might mean, I, I think if there's two kinds of compromise, right? There's, there's, let's, I want to climb Mount Everest. Okay. And I get up to the, what's that called? The, the station where you get yeah, your stuff. Um, base camp or something. Base camp. Okay. I get up to base camp. All right. And I, and I'm the first guy there, let's say I'm climbing up Mount Everest and it's really way far up. And I le- I see this area where there's all kinds of water and it's really nice. Okay. And so I, so I stop and I get everything I need. And now I have a decision to make. This is kind of cool. Should I stop here? Or should I take what I've got here and go up to Everest? And then what happens is a group of people comes up behind me. Well, I've got the river now, right? I've got the creek and the water in it. So now I start selling what I found. Okay. Now it's really nice to stop at base camp Mm because I can get rich off it. Okay. Now that's one, that's the compromise of principle. That's where you, you, you aren't even going to continue to seek your goal. But the other compromise is I'm going to stop at base camp and I'm going to get based. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to get my stuff that I need to climb again. That's right. That's and, right. and that's just accepting your mortality and accepting circumstances. I'm all for that. Nobody, there is not a single classical school in the world today that, that Erasmus would consider a good school. Right. Wow. I am okay with that. Because okay it's that base that. camp idea. I get it. They're on their way. That's exactly. really beautiful. That's and really so what beautiful. we need to do is have enough faith to put together a classical school to the degree that we can and then equip so the next group, the next generation can go to the next level. All right. So- but I will say this, that what generates it, what motivates it is Christ, right? That's what, my what question. Modern, I got it. I got modern, throw this at modern you. education. Sorry. I want to throw this question at you on that. Could okay. I? Could I real quick? Yeah. I saw you threw me for a curve there in, in a way that I should have seen four parents. Let's say four couples. Let's, let's say 10 couples and the 10 couples That's have come many. together. I'm picturing Chicago because I got a friend there that would say this. And those 10 couples say, you know what? We have faith. This is something beautiful. We have faith in the spirit of creativity, which it resides in all of our children and every child. And we want to create a creative school based on the faith we have in, in the creative element of, of human existence. Is that yeah. enough to start? The it's class- a good place to start. Could that community apply your classical studies concepts? And would you have, would you have some sort of modicum of hope that, that they could be successful? Oh yeah. But they're not Christ. Oh, yeah. They're not talking about Christ. Okay. I would say it this way that that Christ is Christ is opposed to absolutely nothing that doesn't oppose him. And so Christ is not the opposite. Like there's there, we don't live in a manichae universe. Right, right. right? Although this people is, want this, to. This, this, <laughs> people do it. Well, it's convenient, it's easier, yep. except you can't get anywhere. Right. So, so if you're dealing with today's problem, tell problems, the media this. Can, let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's let's talk to the media, next, whatever they are. Let's talk. Well, see, see, see. That's the thing. I talked about deliberation earlier, right? And and the, what we've seen in America is a collapse of deliberation, and it's at the school level and it's at the political level. Yeah. Who knows where it came first? I don't know. It it came first from believing that there's good and evil, and I'm good. Right. It's not like that. There, we are all a mess. And we are all created to love the good, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so whether it's we're going with Maximus the Confessor and Nicholas of Cusa, or mm. or the bag, you know, the the Vedanga or whatever it's called, the, the the everybody is Augustine. Everybody is created to love the good, and consequently, if you seek the good that you are capable of perceiving then you are, whether you mean to be or not, you are moving toward Christ. Yeah, yeah. And if you are, and if you are moving toward Christ, then we should celebrate that. And then at some point, at some point you might keep on moving and, and suddenly realize, wow, there's Christ, right? There, there's, there's no guarantee of that. That's between God and the person. Yeah, it's not but really what I'm our getting business. at is this, there's a pardon. It's not really our business. I mean, it's our business, but it's not really right. our business that that creative group of Chicago and classical education pursuers that they also find Jesus. I don't really get that that that's connected that way. It doesn't have to be connected well, that way. Well, yeah, there's two ways to think about that. One is that the name Jesus, and the other is the person Jesus, right? What I want them to find is the person Jesus, mm. and what what a what a what a person who's looking for the conversion is is wanting is that they they name Jesus. Mm. And look. 
the, the Lord tells us there's no other name given among men. So I'm not going to minimize naming, but it's, but it's the name of a person, right? right? And it's, and it's more than a person, even there. It's when I say person, I don't mean somebody you can be on intimate terms with only. I mean, a person who governs the cosmos and whose being explains every other being, yeah. right? Who, who is the, he is the, he is the Tao. He is the lo logos that makes analogos possible, right? The reason, for example, Jonathan Peugeot talks about hierarchy, the reason he can talk about it, the reason he can, we didn't even talk about the temple, which is absolutely my obsession, right? The reason why existence is knowable is because Christ is in it, right? right? And he's manifesting himself to it, to us in it all the time. The heavens declare the glory of God. Right? And that doesn't just mean that when you look into the sky, you go, ah, no, it's actually saying something. There's a message that's being proclaimed, but we're deaf, yeah. right? We don't know how to hear it because we're so hung up on enlightenment thought, but it doesn't need to be that way. We can hear the creation speak to us and it speaks to us formally. It speaks to us about relationships. What do you guys do with origin stories then? Origin, not, not, not the theologian, origin how do you, it feels to me to do what you're doing, classical education, there has to be some sort of coherent origin story that's told within the community yeah. calling themselves educators. And the origin huh. story of evolution, how, you must not. Oh, you mean the, the origin story of yeah, mankind? Like, like, right. Yeah. You know, like, did we come from yeah. Ragnarok or wh wh where did we come from? It feels like the community that you're talking about that adopts classical education, they have to have a coherent origin story. Could it be evolution? So that's a, that's fun. Okay. So I would say this, that, that the people who adopt classical education are many and varied. And so you've got secular classical schools, you've got, um, um, progressive people doing classical education. You got Muslim classical schools. Now you've got oh, uh, evangelical reformed Lutheran. You've got all kinds of, of different variations. And one of the things that distinguishes each of them would be something like their origin story. Right. And so so if you are if you are a, a Thomistic Catholic, you're either going to be a neo Thomist from the 20th century with a very rich conception of the dignity of human nature and so on. Or you're going to be something like a, a two tier Thomist from the early 20th, late 19th century, where where you're going to have this dark view of mankind. And you're kind of, I would say you're going to go into something like Manichaeism. And if you do, if you, you, you could do both of those, right? You, and you could, you could fall under the umbrella of classical. So the, so the question that everybody's constantly asking is, what is classical? And what I would say is this, that what classical isn't is an education that's, that denies human nature, that denies there's such a thing as human nature, okay? What classical isn't is sophistry, although there was sophistry in the classical world. It's not relativism, right? right what classical right. is, is it's logocentric. It, it acknowledges that there is a logos yep. and that is the ultimate origin story, right? The RK, NRK, in the beginning, in the first principle, in, in the, the beginning of all was the NRK in logos, right? There, Christ is wow. the origin story. That's right. and, and everything, literally everything, Everything flows from his being. Dostoevsky so the origin says, story. Dostoevsky says he says art. Now he doesn't he doesn't say classical education. It's the same idea. He says art, all art and all artists have to start from the idea that there was nothing, and then there was something, and there's meaning in the something. And that's exactly right. The word meaning is so important. Logos. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, because in that great inversion, that notion that we lived in a meaningful world was overthrown, right? That that cosmos became chaos and meaning, it's just a machine now. And so you stand outside it and you observe it and now knowledge has become impossible. You only can have this externalized analytical knowledge wow. about something, but you can't participate in the being of anything. And that makes you lonely. It makes you fragmented. It makes you not a good friend. And, and we've forgotten. It, it wipes your mind clean. It takes me back to your idea of the vigil keepers. Mm -hmm. There's somebody, you, that has keeping this vigil, this this classical education vigil, mm -hmm. which is really just, I see mm -hmm. what you're doing now. 
Classical education is not classical. It's a code word for logocentric being. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's, what that's I mean. how I perceive it. Now, again, I'm, I'm one person who identifies with the classical tradition or with classical education. So other people will have different definitions and understandings. Sorry to create chaos, but that's definitely how I see it. And that's because I begin with a Christian classical education. My computer, for some reason, does that ridiculous thumbs I up. Like thing. I like that. <laughs> that I, awesome. I, I just said something I like. I'm going to let you know I like Guys, <laughs> Andrew just liked himself. He just was yeah. like, I'm doing a great job. <laughs> and then his thumb appeared on his screen. <laughs> do you, what do you think of Marcus Aurelius? Uh, how does he fit into it? Because I think for many people outside of maybe your Circe, he seems to be something like a father of classical education or something as a Stoic. Is that... Is, is he well, relevant he's a Stoic. to your story? So the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius is the fourth, third century AD. So he's 700 years, 800 years after the, the, the golden age. Of yeah, classical. he's late. I get it. He's late, late. But there's something about him. And he's also in him. that transition period. Sorry? There's something about him as told to me when we were trying to, that his process, he was trying to save the Roman Empire from a type of meaninglessness, right. a vanity, right? And that something right. he was trying to do was to re-infiltrate what he thought was a really good corpus and, and do it in a way that he Rome could be Rome again. And I'm not saying that's what you're doing, but it has a similar pattern. It has a similar pattern. Well, okay, good, good. That's great. Because because the distinction I would make is, is well, I have Christ is the, is the biggest distinction, but right. the, the distinction I would make philosophically is Marcus Aurelius was a, a, a classic Roman in that he was trying to preserve something that was already built, and he was trying to um, he was trying to um, codify it so that by thinking about it like he did, you could have a renewed civilization. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He couldn't give the gift of the Holy Spirit, for example. But what he could do is he could give people who are dealing with lots of pain means to do so. Mm. And he could help them discover that there's meaning in their pain, right? So, so Marcus Aurelius is a really good example of what I mean when I say Christ only opposes what opposes him. Uh -huh. There's a lot of wisdom in Marcus Aurelius's writings because it aligns with the Logos. But as soon as he differs from the Logos, he's now spoken that's right. He's, he's spoken um, inadequately. Mm -hmm. But there's a massive difference between speaking inadequately and speaking like you are an unregenerate sons of the de son of the devil, like I once heard a rock band called. You, know, you, you, are, you are just, we're all groping, Paul said. We're all groping. And Marcus Aurelius um, lived at a time and had a disposition and a character that, that, and had good mentors who led him to see some really great manifestations of the imminent presence of Christ in the cosmos. Yeah, yeah. And in the and in the soul. And so we should embrace those things, but we mustn't become as a Christian, right? We mustn't we mustn't we must embrace them, but we mustn't become stoic. Right? There, there's things that stoics do that we should learn from, but I'm like, I'm not a stoic Christian. My goal isn't to become a stoic Christian. My goal is to be a Christian. But in the degree to which stoicism can help me understand Christianity, yeah, I'm right. all for it. To, yeah. to help me understand Christ. And let me say in response to that, to what I just said, <laughs> really quickly, I cannot even begin to describe for you how much Homer has helped me understand the yeah. Bible. There I cannot even begin to describe it. Well, that and I'll add this. The book of Hebrews is a response to the Odyssey, in part. Why? Explain that. Well, because in the first line of the Odyssey, this is one evidence here, um, the reason, you said why, so the reason is because it's being written to Jews and Greeks, right? because any Jew in the first century was a Hellenistic Jew, so there, that's all there was. Mm -hmm. But so it's being written to Jews who are in the Greek tradition, right? And it's speaking to them as though they're Jews and as though they're Greeks. But what the first clue for me was this. In the first line of the Odyssey, Homer begins by saying, sing goddess of the man of polutropon. Polutropon. 
which is an utterly untranslatable word. Pick up seven different copies of the Odyssey. They will all translate that line differently, <laughs> which is brilliant on Homer's part because polutropon might well mean many meanings. <laughs> oh, itself. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So tropoi can mean transformation. It can mean changes. You might read Sing Goddess of the Man of Many Twists and Turns, the Man of Many Journeys, the Man of Many uh, Tricks, right? It could be, it's, there's all of those are right, right? Okay. So, so if you read the Odyssey and every, everybody at that era who got educated memorized the opening of the Odyssey and maybe the whole Odyssey. Okay. So, so then you turn to the book of Hebrews and the first verse says, having spoken to the fathers in the prophets, through the prophets, in many portions and in polotropon. Now, and in many meanings. That might, that might just be a coincidence. And I, at first, that's what I thought. I just kind of chuckled and went on. But over the years, I've thought about it and I've looked, I've watched, I've, you know, explored the book of Hebrews and almost the entire book. If I'm a Greek in the first century, as well as I can understand that line, I can read the book of Hebrews and it is talking straight to me. Right. And, and that's the first one. He says to the, you know, in, in Corinthians, Paul says, Jews, uh, Greeks seek for a uh, uh, Jews seek, seek for a sign and Greeks seek wisdom. OK, so he gives signs and the book of Hebrews is signs for the Jews, the, the, the altar, the tabernacle, everything is signs, right? Mm -hmm. Meaningful signs. Mm -hmm. But he's also got riddles in there for the Greeks. And so so that's that's Greeks just love indirect communication. They love the Odyssean, you know, hiding things. And so in the very first line, what, what, what the author of Hebrews, I believe, is saying to the Greek reader is, Odysseus was great, Homer was great, Christ is better than the angels, Christ is better than Moses, Christ is also better than Odysseus. But he doesn't come right out and say that. He says it to a way the Greek mind is going to go, oh, that's cool. That's the, same, that's the idea, which very, it comforts me, which is, if you're not opposed to Logos, then you're part and parcel of the answer. But where you become opposed, you actually become diabolos, you become against that right. which is is whole. And that that That's really right. is, I think, a description of progressive education today. It's probably oh, yeah. actually against, right? That's what's happening. 400 years now, it's been diabolic. It's been div divisive. It's been fragmenting. The mm -hmm. European mind collapsed. If you want to see the European mind in its full realization, you got to read Hamlet. If you're wondering why can't Hamlet act, just look at all the issues so he has great. to deal with. So passive, yeah. And it's you can't if you actually try to get into Hamlet's mind, you will realize there's nothing this guy can do. He is one of the greatest heroes in all of literature for the very fact that he was at the end willing to die. He nobody else has ever had to deal with as much as he had to deal with in all of literature, except Christ. And so in the classroom, the this. Real. In the classroom, in a classical classroom, wherever that is, maybe on this internet right now between you and I, that whole conversation about Hamlet can take you wherever you need to go, and there's no exam that ends the day. Or what do your exams look like then? And how do you how do you hmm. how do you put your parents at ease with the outcomes? Well, again, we have to compromise. The grade. You, you, here's a question you'll love. Can you tell me when the first written essay received a number grade? I really do like this. I want to try to guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to go around the time of Dewey, but I'm probably way too late. You're a bit late. <laughs> it, was, it was 1792, I think was the year, late 18th century, Scotland, University of Edinburgh. A professor decided that it was too hard to 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 just deal with all the instructions, so he so he, he did what the Scottish Enlightenment did. He quantified it, and that from sense. that day to this, I ask you: Has writing improved or disimproved? Just toilet. <laughs> now, there's been a lot of good writing, so don't don't misunderstand me. There's been a lot of good writing, but it's never come from grades, right? No, no. If you want to become a good writer, sure. you go to a writing workshop. And, and you have, you have a, a creative master model for you, coach you, you get apprenticed, okay? Classical education has always been an apprenticeship by a master teaching a, 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 an apprentice and then a journeyman. In other words, it's like discipleship. 
Okay. In, but what happened is after the 18th century with the enlightenment in Scotland and then the industrial revolution systems took over. Yeah. And if, if you, if the cosmos is a mechanism, then schools have to be a mechanism that reflect the cosmic mechanism. Right. True. And so we needed to, we needed to quantify everything and we don't trust people. You see, yeah. we don't trust the teacher. Well, how, part of the reason for that is because what I said earlier, 1951, there's too many. And then, and then, too many people had to learn how to teach too fast and teaching that you can't learn how to teach fast. And so then what happens is you start having these colleges that replace the normal school, right? You get all these, these, well, here, let me just say education departments don't know what education is. And, and I, and I say that because one time I was talking to a group in Ohio and after three days, three days only of teacher coaching of teacher development, just three days of teacher training within the school, at the end of it, a lady who got her PhD in education from Ohio State said these words to me. You just taught me more in these three days than I learned in my entire career and my entire education at Ohio State. Because they don't know what education is. No. Literally, they don't know what it is, but they use the word, right? And a part of the reason for that is because they live in an age that it's about words. Words don't mean, right? We have to reconnect words to logos, with no men to logos. We have to reconnect right. the words that we say to the things we're talking about. I like to put it this way. You and I, when we speak, we speak mimetic logoi. We speak imitative words. Mm -hmm. When God speaks, he speaks creative words, right? He speaks created logoi. And the created logoi are the things. The mimetic logoi are the names. If you lose the idea that God spoke the tree into existence, you really don't worry about your language. That's but if great. you worry, but if you believe that God spoke the tree into existence, now you have to name it rightly because your, your naming it is going to affect it and it wow. has to be loving. Wow. And then to go back, just two ticks right there. The name that I give it has relevance and meaning because I gave it. It's not, it's not really relevant to reality as it exists in God. If if God didn't speak it into existence, what difference does it make? What language you call it, I call it. As long as it's in accordance and in alignment with what I believe, because in the end, I'm the yeah. ultimate arbiter. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah but that, I used it's to pragmatic. think pragmatic. It's pragmatic. It's all, all pragmatic, and it's also weirdly tribal. In other words, it, it's oh, yes. really just relevant to the, the very smallest of of you know organisms or, or societies. And that's why I don't, I have a question for you because gosh, you're the right guy to ask for this. There's this <laughs> egalitarian push. Have I uh, answered any of your questions yet? Though? No, it's, we just talking now, by the way, usually my questions are so, they're so open-ended that no, uh, people always say to me, well, what's the question? Uh, you're doing great. <laughs> we, we don't have to go. Oh, down thank there, you. Right? Here's my, here's my, my question. There's this, for me as a teacher, and I taught a long time in the South Bronx, in Harlem, mm. and I taught you. kids. I taught kids coming out of what you know, non-classical neighborhoods. Let's put it like that. Yeah, yeah. In, in terms of yeah. their the relevance to the to society, we think of as classical, and classical here meaning not white or black, but rich or poor. Because I think I would yeah. like to talk to you about rich and poor as a type of. It's a code word in classical education that these are wealthy people. I know you're changing that. I know that's not, those aren't synonyms, but let me just say this. There's an egalitarian push in the Bronx in the nineties to get everybody an equal education. And I know that starts with Dewey. Dewey's definitely doing that. And and he, he wants to everybody to access this thing, this special system that allows, you know, all the beautiful things in life is the egalitarian impulse. Does that have to, to die for our systems of education to become better? And do you worry about that? Do you worry about it? Depends that? what you mean. Um, I don't, education can't be done at the scale we're trying to do it in America. Hmm. Right. So, so, so the, there, there is a, an illusion of localism in the American school where you can have school boards you have arguments about specific things, but basically the system is the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot more money goes into the rich suburbs because it's property taxes, right? Which is another example of what I mean by the system just doesn't work. It's disaster. Right. Don't get me started on that. I can go a long time on that one. 
That's yeah. Honest. This is this is what I think about the e equality issue. We will always have the poor with us. I have an really great authority that that's the case. <laughs> I love the idea that everybody should have access to the beautiful things. Okay. And and Dewey, you know, he he in his lab school, he did have kids studying Greek and Latin, for example. We we would look back at what Dewey actually did in his school and call it classical. Yeah, we call it old But it had different mm -hmm. but it had different uh, moral and intellectual foundations. And so it, it never took. But a system got put in place. And this is this is what I believe is is when people bear responsibility for the decisions they make, they make better decisions. Okay, they learn things and they make better decisions. When you can blame somebody else for your decision or transfer the consequences of your decision to somebody else, you will make bad decisions. The goal of the American education system is to make sure that whoever makes the decision doesn't have to pay the price for it. Yeah. And so what you do is you create administrative structures and managerial tools that ensure that you have abstract, big sweeping abstract decisions on a, on a, you know, a massive scale. And then the person who makes them gets gold plated. Yeah. They're protected. Wins awards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's protected. Yeah, and and I, I've I've actually said I could I could I could go into a school and destroy it in five years and be praised to high heaven for it, just by quantifying everything. There you go. Yeah, and just absolutely. by just by putting in places, and everybody would love it. They think, oh yeah, it's so exciting, and I could use the buzzwords and everything. People just love that because they're scared, and the buzzwords make them feel comfortable. They make them feel located. Wow. So let's replace the buzzword buzzwords with meaningful words. And then let's return responsibility. Let's turn accountability to the decision maker. Okay, so a teacher who is teaching well, you're going to see fruit from that teaching. And that teacher should be rewarded for it, but not rewarded by the city of New York. That's way too far away. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it's just like kids. What's the reward kids want the most? Nice job. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. They, they they want you to look at them in the eye. You know what everybody's dying for, John? I'll tell you right now. I'll tell you the secret to human race, to the human race. Everybody would give their souls to hear these words from somebody they respect. Well done. Yeah, man. That's also biblical. So you have to earn, you have to earn the right to assess another person for his work. In other words, you have to have their respect. This is true between husbands and wives, parents and children. Yeah, there you go. Bosses, everybody. It, you have to earn the right to say to a person, that was well done, or fix that. But if you but if they're laboring and striving to get that well done for you, they don't care how you give it to them. You might put a crown on their head. You might say, sit at my right hand. That's right. You might say, go out and play. You might say, this is yours. Freely enjoy it. You might say... Um, this is really good, but you should work on this part here, right? But if but if the goal is that everybody wants things well done, okay, then you're going to see more things well done. Hmm. Now, what I'm not doing here is I'm not being utopian. No system could make this happen. And here's the irony. The only way what I'm talking about here, there's two ways what I'm talking about here could spread rapidly. One is that a few people could do it in some place and it would prove itself. And then other people nearby would see it. Right? And that is happening in the classical arena. I think so. When I, I went to so. my first classical conference, I think there were 67 people at it. That was the whole classical world at the time, practically. 1993. Now there's thousands, tens, it's all over the world. Yes, right? it, it is. started like nothing. Okay. So when people, when people see something well done, they respond to it. Okay. The other thing that could bring that world into existence is if this catastrophe of a system actually collapsed. And that would be terrible because, because a lot of people would suffer. 
parents and children. But if every teacher in America, no, I don't even think like that. If a teacher is listening to this talk and wants to see the world change, wants to see education changed, right? Then what I would say is this, in the classroom, the co-op, the home, wherever it is you're teaching, take full responsibility to make sure that the child in your classroom is getting the best education that you can possibly give to the best ability, to the best of your understanding. Just do the best that you can do. And in each child in your classroom or in learning in whatever it is, in your learning setting, make sure that each child is hearing you say well done in some meaningful way, some way that means to them, well done, right? You know how there's love languages? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's honor languages too. People hear well done differently. No doubt. Okay. Figure out what kind of honor a child responds to and not to manipulate them and not to flatter them because the Bible absolutely condemns flattery. It's one of the most wicked things you can do precisely because our souls are so hungry for honor, hungry for honor. Did you but just you describe self-esteem education? Was that self-esteem education? You just well, said? I think it's a corruption of it. It's and, a disaster, some people yeah. make good use of it and some people it's not manicky, right? But yeah, that's a corruption. That's, 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 when, what, as soon as you turn it into a formula and a system, it's bad. It's bad right? yeah. I mean, yeah. The soul doesn't like those things. It's manipulative. But if you actually figure, again, this has to be the individual teacher. Look at the children in your classroom and ask yourself, what kind of honor does that person respond to? And give that person that kind of honor. And then watch them, because the Bible says, give honor to whom it is due. Find reasons to give them the honor due them. Okay? And then... When they hear you say, well done, which is a, what I mean by honor, that's largely what I mean by honor. No, even before you say, well done, you're always honoring them, right? Then make sure that they're fully accountable for the work that you're giving them to do. If they're not accountable for it, why are you giving it to them, right? right. That's the question I would right. have. Right. So make sure they're accountable. And what will happen is that eternal soul in the seat in front of you will be nourished. And your eternal soul will be nourished. And after that, God could do a miracle if he wanted to and change the whole country. But that's up to him. Right? What he won't do, as it says in James, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Yeah. And if we're concerned about egalitarianism so and equality, the one way we're not going to get justice, the one way we're not going to get equality in any meaningful sense is through anger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's only love. But if we actually believe in the power of love, which all our pop songs sing about all the time, but if we actually were con would come to believe in the power of love, which gives honor to whom it is due and nourishes the soul of each particular person, right, then the world would be changed. And we've seen that over and over again in, in the history of the church. That's just that. That last part to me resonates as a teacher, a former teacher, uh, mm. teaching now too, but differently. All right, last question, then let's finish up. Otherwise, Andrew will, he'll just chop it into three parts and make it three podcasts and it'll just be Andrew <laughs> all week long, all day. But oh, no. this has been fantastic. By the way, this will be another, let's Thank do it. We'll do another conversation for sure. Yes. Um, I can give you. I can give you a lot We're of friends. Yeah, we'll do it. Well, I'll see you again too at the conference, which we'll put all the links to what Cersei's doing this year. There's a national conference. There's a couple of regional conferences. We'll put that in there. Thank I'm going to, I'm going to speak at one of them. I'm, I'm excited that you guys are, have turned out to be a real blessing in the latter oh, half God. of last year, just meeting your son. And it's been beautiful. I, a quick last question. I bet you mean Matt. Oh yeah. 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 I've met my son too. Yeah. 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 Well, I meet him on, on, on online. I've, I've, I yeah. met him on the phone and in that way, but I'll see him soon. He had a baby. Well, right? he makes me very proud. He makes me very proud. Dude. So I'm glad you met him. Very good guy. Um, so this book's going to come out and the inversion is what you're going to tell us about. Thank goodness. I've been talking about the, if you go back and listen to all our podcasts, you're, you're talking about education and the inversion and I'm talking about culture and the inversion and, and what, ha mm. how, how the enlightenment, it, it it, where it was good, fine. It produced material wealth, but yeah. where it was bad, it was really bad. So, um, yeah. uh, here's my question. And we just go quick to it. How does the inversion end? Like it's going to, on some level, if you had to guess, what would these schools, what do they look like? Like, 
how do they fall apart or does it fall apart or what do you think happens? So anytime you have what, what I'm going to call a communist system or a, or a, or a socialist maybe system, but anytime you have a system that is full of people who aren't accountable for their actions, that system will expand as far as it can. And as it does, so it will suck energy into it like a black hole. Mm. So when there's no longer any energy sources, it will collapse on itself. And the big, I've wondered for a long time, I've wondered for probably 30 years now, how much longer is the public school system in America going to be able to drain America of its resources, push property taxes through the roof, uh, break down society, increase crime? How much longer is it going to be able to do that before it collapses? And when it collapses, will it take the country with it? And I think that compared to 30 years ago, I'm much more inclined to think that it's just going to take the country with it. Mm. And if that happens, it's probably got quite a ways to go. It might be 50 or 100 years, it might be 10. But the other thing is within that system are microsystems that, that are catastrophically in, um, irresponsible. And those microsystems might start plunge, might start collapsing on themselves. I see. And, and when like a canary in a coal mine, right? And when the microsystem, when the canary dies, when a canary dies, somebody around it is going to say, whoa. And I do think we're already seeing that, right? So already in the seventies, you were seeing people pulling out of the schools. Yep. The homeschool movement is a rejection of the public movement more than anything else. Mm -hmm. The, the charter schools is a rejection of the, of the system, right? And so the, the system is already, it's a, the question is, is it spinning things out by centrifugal force? Or and then they're going to try to in, exist independently. And will they be able to, or, or is, it, is it such a powerful death star? <laughs> is it such a powerful black hole that you really will not, none of us will actually be able to escape its tractor beams and yeah. we're all going to get collapsed into it. And to me, the issue is the more faith, the more rapidly exercised, the sooner we will be able to get away from that system and its collapse will do less damage. Right. But I don't know how far along the path it is to, to destroying the whole country. I mean, you know, the, the funny, this might sound absurd, but you know, what's funny to me is that John Dewey went to Soviet Union. And he taught them how to educate kids and he put a system and he helped them put a system in place. After five years, they shut it down. They said, no, we're not going to do that here because the kids became just a mess. And, and, and I think it was 1935 to 40, but don't quote me on the years, but the Soviet union, which Don John Dewey was very fond of the Soviet union rejected progressive education because it was such a chaotic force. And in America, we embraced it. Because I, I guess because we like the future or something, I don't know. But it can't, but a, a, a nation can say, no, that won't work here. Yeah. Right. And we could do that. You we could. could do that. I hear you. But I, the, the way you describe those alternative, really super destructive forces that are, you know, microcosms within the, the, the bigger, uglier system, those, those, those death stars within the, the, those things yeah, scare me. Yeah. I see them in, especially in oh, big yeah. city education programs. They're so terrible. And they're also, they're not helpful. They're really just trying to be mothers and fathers to kids at some point. And they're so confused. They're trying to be, they're trying to be um, nannies to kids, not yeah, mothers and fathers. Nannies, they don't love but, them. Thank you. That's, that's right. The, 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 um, the, the thing about that is that, um, I guess it's what I said earlier that that it, it's going to come down to whether whether we can love the kids enough, yeah. and those forces that are so destructive only have power that's lent to them. They're parasites, and so if we can, if we can, well, first of all, I think everybody that's listening to this, if they have any opportunity at all, should try to get on local school boards. Right. One of the one of the great ironies of American culture is that Christians in the 40s and 50s decided that their politics was beneath them. And lo and behold, politics went against them when yeah, they pulled that's out. Right. That's right. What a surprise. Right. You, you got to get your hands dirty. And and for oh. 
this is what I was going to say. It's that love thing. What what bothers me the most isn't this you know metaphorical language of systems collapsing. It's not even that the country was, could collapse. What bothers me the most is that there's a kid who's a mile away from me right now who's cutting himself herself yes. because because her life is so empty, right? What bothers me the most is that about a minute ago, somewhere in the state of North Carolina where I live, a kid just shot himself, right? What bothers me the most is that right now, somewhere in LA, there's gangs fighting with each other on a school ground. Yeah. Okay, what bothers, what bothers me the most is that right now, there's a kid taking drugs because he can't handle reality. And the whole society is arguing about legalization of something that it, that that issue is so far down the line. Mm -hmm. Okay, what bothers me the most is that I walk out of a Target in Denver, and there's a kid there begging with a sign, and he looks like he's drugged out completely. And I ask him, "Why why are you here?" And he said, "My parents died in COVID, and there's nobody to take care of me." He's 19 years old, and he's got no life ahead of him, and he's ruined. Right. That's what bothers me is it, it, it's, 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 it's forget the statistics. Every single one of those children in your classroom and in your home is an eternal soul. The value of that soul is eternal. And so are all these children who are suffering so intensely. Mm -hmm. There is an unmeasurable value in that child that we want to, we want to, well, when they're kids, we feel sorry for them. When they're adults, we we get mad at them. Yeah, right. Let's let's yeah. End it our there. our society is melting down, but that's because the people in it are no. But we don't love children. We hate children in our society. That's why that's, we hate children. That, we have sentiment toward them, and the more we talk about how much we we love them, the more obvious it is that we hate them. But as a society, we hate children. They're a nuisance and inconvenience. They get in the way of our careers. They get in the way of our lives. We abort them. We, we beat them, we sell them into slavery, we kidnap them. And, and, and when somebody makes a movie about it, we think it's an extremist thing, right? Yeah. How can you have a society that cares so little about children? Uh, because you have a society that have been taught that the world is their own thoughts. Like it's an individual's thoughts mm -hmm. is the world. And so why would I want to invest in somebody who's, not me. <laughs> like, let's just be honest. <laughs> That's what's happening. Yeah. And the combination with that is we've been taught to despair that we're utterly helpless. Yeah. There's and it doesn't help, do you know, I, I'm ending now. We got to, otherwise I'm going to, but I got it. Yeah. This is my beef that I would love to talk to you about. It doesn't help that we've been telling ourselves for 300 years that we're just animals and that we're a little bit more right. evol evolved. Could we stop that conversation already? It's another comment. That's another thing we can talk about. Yeah. But, all right, yeah. brother. So, Seriously, we'll put in the links. Um, joy to have you on. This was fun. Thank you. It's been fun. I, I'm, I, I think I warned you. I can talk for a long time about a simple question. But forgive that's, me. <laughs> that's good for me. Um, my job is to get you to talk. You have the wisdom, and a lot of people will look at the title. You know, we'll, we'll make sure that it's classical education, and people like education podcasts because everybody wants to know what to do with their kid. And so, uh, well, I, I, in that regard, I just really, truly hope that my sweeping statements don't are taken turn as off, yeah. particular and, 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 and that people don't feel like I'm attacking them, right? Every one of your listeners loves their children and also is frustrated with them. And that's normal. We all just have to keep on fighting. So please, if you heard me, you know, generalizing statements about parenthood and you felt like I was attacking you, please forgive me for that. I, I apologize. I, that's not what I meant to to say at all. Oh, good. Don't worry. If you noticed uh, two educators can go on and on and on, you might remember that about your own life. Like, not this teacher again, oh Lord, but it was, and it was good. I don't care what anybody says. Love listening to Andrew Kern. Check out the links. Uh, if you're, if you're a homeschooler or if you're at home and your kids come home and you want them to have an education beyond the education they had, check out their website. There are so many things there to talk about and to offer. It's a clearinghouse of really cool classical education ideas. And they're smart. 
Check them out, CRC Institute. Andrew will link it. www.first-things.org is our website. Consider being a monthly donor. I would like that. You're like, a donation to what though, buddy? Uh, we send people all around the world to immerse, learn local language, and then find local people who are deeply impoverished. Trust me, deeply. And by living in a mud hut next to them, we can assess really good projects and we move resources toward those people with really good ideas. Yeah, that's what we do. And our guys sacrificed two years of their lives to go do that. Please consider your support. I'll end with this. If you like candles, not candles, really good candles, like nice candles, the nicest candles ever. I don't know. They shine bright in your house. They're very beautiful. They're called Glassy Baby. Get Glassy Baby, and when you do, some of what you buy comes back to First Things Foundation. That's the kind of people they are. By the way, our color is green. Whenever you find the green on their website, that's that's our color. That's the kind of Glassy Babies we get. So, who loves you? Take care. Much love. See you next time soon on... Heavy things done lightly. <laughs>